It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of April 8th, 2005. And once again, we only got two movies to look at today. One that is uh, one of the biggest, unfortunately one of the biggest bombs of all time, but is isn't really a bad movie. We'll talk about that one. And a movie that proves that, hey, there was hope for Jimmy Fallon after Saturday Night Live. And uh, we'll talk about that one later on in the show, but um, let's get to that first movie. One of the biggest box office failures of all time, and that is Matthew McConaughey in the action-adventure comedy Sahara. So there is a little bit of an interesting history behind this movie and the fact that, as I said before, it was one of the biggest box office failures of all time because it only grossed $119 million worldwide off of a budget of $160 million. So in the, in the, in the long scheme of things, it didn't end up making back any of its money. It actually lost a lot of money for Paramount in general. But then following that, there was a massive lawsuit in which the author of the books, this is based off of Clyde Custler, was involved in a lengthy legal action suit with the film's producer, Philip Ostrantz, is unshown to his company, Crusader Entertainment. And it went on for several years, and there wasn't any further developments until in December 2012, both parties were back in court to see which side was responsible for paying the case's $20 million legal bill. However, the second Apelia D Districts for California Appeals Court declared that there was no prevailing party for purposes of attorney fees and then concluded that after years of lit litigation, both sides recovered nothing, not one dime of damages, and no declaratory relief. And this is probably the reason why, Clive C why Cl Dirk Pitt has never made it back to the big screen. This was actually the second time he made it to the big screen. The first was the inf was another bad movie, 1980's Race the Titanic, which was also a failure. So, um, so yeah, the story behind this movie is failure all around. But is the movie itself that terrible? You've got a story here where Matthew McConaughey plays a treasure hunter who ends up partnering with a doctor from the World Health Organization to find a lost American Civil War ironclad warship in the Sahara Desert. Now, I went to go see this movie in theaters for the first time when it came out, and I didn't hate it. I bought it on DVD shortly after it came out, but honestly, I hadn't seen it in over tw in nearly 20 years. I only watched it again recently to get ready for this review, and I gotta say, it's one that, it's passable. It's not a bad movie, but it's not a great movie either. It's a movie that just has so much behind-the-scenes drama going towards it. I, don't even, I didn't even bring up the whole thing about the cost and bribery allegations about this movie. Like, they, like uh, there was a story that the New York Times put out dissecting the budget of the movie, and it showed how Hollywood movies can cost so much to produce and fail, and there was a whole thing where the, the film was initially greenlit with a budget of $80 million and rose up to $100 million to $160 million, and thus making it one of the biggest flops of all time. And, uh, yeah, they really wanted this to be a success, but... I think the biggest problem with the movie in general was that, one, all that money that was going into the budget. This movie had to make, usually I think they say it's like, if you make back three or four, it's like either three to five times your original budget. If you make that much back, you're pretty much guaranteed to have a successful franchise and a, and a successful series of films going forward. And uh, yeah, this thing was not going to make its money back in, in any way, shape, or form. And not only that, you got all the behind-the-scenes stuff that's affecting the movie in general, and it would help if the movie was actually really good, because if, if the movie was really good, then we could forget about those problems behind the scenes, but with all those problems behind the scenes, it definitely shows in the big in the film adaptation that all this all this bad, all this word of mouth, that negative word of mouth for a movie that's this bland, I mean, it's not even that it's a bad movie, it's just a bland film. Matthew McConaughey is a cool dude, and he has shown that time and time again that he is more than capable of taking on a role this caliber, but in this case, it's just like, he's not really given a whole lot to do. There's not really a whole lot of good jokes that are given to him. There's not really a lot of adventure going on in this. Steve Zahn and Penelope Cruz are just kind of there to be the sidekicks and Cruz to be the love interest in general. You also have Glenn Turman, Wayne Wilson. This is just a couple of a weeks before. This is just right around the time The Office was coming on. You see well, William H. Macy in the trailer there, Delroy Lindo. It's got a good cast. It's got a good idea. There's a good story you could tell with this character, but the problem with this movie is just that there's nothing really that significant going on here that you haven't seen done better in much better movies. Hell, the Indiana Jones movies and the Mummy movies have done this, is, are much better at taking something of this caliber and making something fun out of it. And granted, Indiana Jones does it a whole lot better than The Mummy does, but The Mummy does it at least in a way that's still fun nonetheless, regardless of how stupid it gets. But this, this is just pushing its luck, and it really needed to be a great, great movie from the beginning to have any kind of hope of making it successful, and it just, it just wasn't there. And it's a shame, because it's not a bad movie, it's just that everything was going against it, and it just had to take a Christmas miracle 
to make that happen and it just, to make it be successful and it just it wasn't there and sadly this is the end result of it a movie that is just such a disappointment with so much talent on board it's not a bad movie but it's just one that you look at and go like the potential there was, so, was easily right there you could have made something great out of this and just it just wasn't there so yeah um, not a not a negative review but not a great review either of Sahara just a disappointing review to say the least but, um, so with that said, let's get to the easily the best movie of the week, and that is a Fever Pitch with Jimmy Fallon, Drew Barrymore, and a new and the new film from the director of the from the Fairly Brothers. Excuse me. So you have a movie here where there was hope for Jimmy Fallon when he left Saturday Night Live. I know Taxi wasn't a good start to his career, but a movie like this, and you know you pair him up with Drew Barrymore, who were two likable. Both of these people were likable personalities back in the day, unlike now, where they're kind of seen as pariahs on, when it comes to their talk shows. Drew Barrymore gets way too close to her guest, and uh, Jimmy Fallon has just become a, a bland Tonight Show host in the long run when it's all said and done. But in this case, in this particular movie, you have a story where it's essentially, this is based off of a book by Nick Hornsby, and this is actually based off of a remake of one of his films, which in turn was based off of a book he wrote, as I mentioned before. And uh, in this story, you have um, the story here of Jimmy Fallon as this ra as this rabid uh, Boston Red Sox fan. Like he worships the Boston Red Sox like crazy, and you know he falls in love with this with this woman played by Drew Barrymore, and she's trying to juggle the relationship between him between him and also his relationship with the team because he has such a massive love for the fan base, the team in general, and it just gets to a point where something's got to give with him. You know, something has to come to to turns like he's got to choose between the, being the diehard Red Sox fan or spending the rest of his life with this with this woman he met who he really loves and yeah it's this really is one of the Fairley Brothers most underrated movies this is probably high up there with some of their best movies in general when you think about it because it really is a very good well-made love story like it's a really good story between a guy who is so desperate to keep this die-hard fan fandom in his heart that he has for this team but he also has this he also has this love for this woman he meets and the chemistry between Fallon and Barrymore works works very well. They're both very funny. They're given a lot of very funny elements to work with in general. And it's got a really good cast involved in this movie. Like not only not only with Barrymore and Fallon, but you see it in the trailer there. You know, Joe Beth Williams, Willie Garson. You know, um, Ioni Sky, Katie Strickland, Marissa Jarrett Winoka, uh, Lenny Clark. You know, just a number a number of different people that you've seen in a lot of other works, and they're just incredible to watch here in this movie. They're very fun to watch in general, and it's a really amazing film. It's a really damn good movie that I think a lot of people definitely deserve to give a lot more credit to. And it's also a very interesting story behind this whole thing, because in the original plot of the movie, it was supposed to be that, you know, the Red Sox were losing the playoffs. However, this was, keep in mind, this was in 2004. This was when the Red Sox stunned the baseball world when they won four straight games to win the ALCS against the Yankees, and then, you know, they broke the curse of the Bambino by beating the St. Louis Cardinals in the World Series, and thus, the ending had essentially needed to be rewritten, and on the day of Game 4, the Fairleys decided to bring back uh, Barrymore Fallon and, you know, have him go to the game of Bush Stadium in character, and so when the Red Sox finally made the final out to secure the win that broke the curse, they had the Fox cameras on the live broadcast catching Barrymore and Fallon in character running onto the field and kissing to celebrate. And uh, you can watch, the, you can actually find that alternate version on the, uh, I think it's on the, here's the thing, on the DVD, it's like two different DVDs. Like you have to get like the, the regular, like on the regular DVD, you don't get the alternate ending. You had to get like a special, a special DVD that goes along is that was available, but on the Blu-ray version, you can find both endings on there, and it's very interesting to see how this would have turned out if it had gone, if this had gone a completely different way, but the movie literally had to change because of the world that was changing around them for this particular movie to work. Not only that, there was also a number of different directors involved in this. Originally, it was going to be Sean Levy, who was a big fan of Nick Hornby's work, who was attached to direct it with Gwyneth Paltrow starring in the role of Lindsay instead of Drew Barrymore. She ended up turning it down because the script she thought was mediocre, and if we're being honest, she probably wasn't the best choice overall to do that to do that role in particular. I feel like that should have gone to somebody like Drew Barrymore, who made that work very well. And so Brian Robbins eventually came on board, and then eventually it, he left, and then Jay Russell came on board, P.J. Hogan, Luke Greenfield, Mira Nair, all were rumored candidates until the Fairley Brothers eventually came on board. And for the Fairley Brothers, you know, 
keep in mind, they were doing a lot of gross-out, humor-style comedy, like really stupid, over-the-top, obnoxious comedy. That, that, that was their bread and butter. So for them to do like a simple, straightforward film that's essentially a romantic comedy in general and make it work as well as it did, it really, it, it really does begin to show like the change of the change that the Fairley brothers were going through at this point because keep in mind these are the same people that were at this point were behind stuff like Dumb and Dumber, Kingpin, There's Something About Mary, Me, Myself and Irene, Osmosis Jones, Shallow House, Stuck on You. Movies that were very are very different compared to this. This is probably the most straightforward, you know, straightforward film that they've done without a whole lot of like over the top screwball comedy, gross out comedy in general. I mean, it's a really it's a really impressive feat for these guys to come in and do a film that's completely outside of their norm and just take it out, take it with this and just have a great, do a great job with it. I mean, I mean, it's a really fantastic film, man. It's a really damn good movie that I can't recommend enough. It's one that I feel like you should definitely give it a shot in general. And, you know, when I went to see this, that not only did I get to see that, I got to see the, I got to see a really good American Dad short that came in front of it uh, inside the CIA. And I, honestly, if anything, I went to go back to this movie multiple times just to see that short because, because I was really looking forward to that show in general. But the movie was really great, too, and I'm glad to see that this film... I'm glad to see that this film has gotten some legacy over the years, but not enough that I think people in general know exactly what kind, know exactly how good of a movie it is, especially considering that it has Jimmy Fallon involved with it, and he's kind of pari kind of a pariah now. But this movie does show you that Jimmy Fallon has pot had potential as an actor, and he's really good in the movie. Drew Barrymore's great. It's a movie that I can't recommend enough. Definitely check this out. This is one of the best underrated comedies I've ever seen. Definitely worth a watch. Fever Pitch. And so with that said, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies, and the next time we meet, we head to a pretty significant week in my life, because, yeah, we only got one movie to look at, and not even a great one, the Amityville Horror, but this weekend in particular was historic in my life, because this was the week that my high school show that I did, but in my, it was when I went, when I was uh, in the media class in high school, this was where it all began for me with the whole, with the reviewing movies in general. Where I did the thing with the you know the Fr the uh, Franklin Regional Weekend Entertainment Planner, which was the predecessor to talking about the movies. This is where it all began, and um, this is a very significant week in my life. And uh, if I could find the DVD that I have of the some of the stuff I have left over, I'll definitely tr try to find it for you for tomorrow's show and definitely talk about this week in particular. But we're taking a look at the Amityville Horror remake, which is not a great movie by any means, but it's something we got to talk about, but you'll probably be more interested in the stuff that I have to show you from my t from tw almost 20 years ago when I was in high school. But um, that'll be for the next time we meet, uh, tomorrow's show, so check that out then. But until then, thank you so much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the place on the next page, check out the previous episode, and also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. And before I go, Time About the Movies flashback begins again tonight as we start our look back at 1987, and we've only got one movie for Christmas of 1987, but it's a good one, Good Morning Vietnam with Robert Williams, so we'll take a look at that. That'll be coming up in just a little bit after I post this episode, but um, stay tuned for that. Uh, until the next time I see you, which will be in just a few moments, take care.